Uh, today we have the pleasure of hosting Dr. Jean In for a talk on early transplantation for severe alcoholic hepatitis. Dr. Jean In is an assistant professor of medicine at the Icon School of Medicine in Mount Sinai in the Division of Liver Diseases. He completed his internal medicine gastroenterology training at Woodford University Hospital. Dr. In then went on to complete a transplant and hepatology fellowship here at Mount Sinai and is now the fellowship associate program director for that program. He is an UNOS certified transplant and hepatologist at the Lucanti Miller Transplantation Institute. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jean in. Hi, everybody. Uh, I apologize for the delay. It's like the ultimate stress test being traffic for an hour and a half, running here, and then having to give a talk. So hopefully I, I, I'm still going to survive this. So I uh, appreciate that. Um, so I have no relevant disclo disclosures. So let's just jump right into it since we've lost a little time. I'm going to talk to you today uh, about early liver transplantation for severe alcoholic hepatitis, but I want to talk a little bit about how we got there, all right? So uh, a little bit about alcoholism, alcoholic liver disease, uh, how that segues uh, into alcoholic hepatitis at times, uh, the assessment of severity in these very sick patients, the treatment of alcoholic hepatitis, and then lastly, the uh, concept of early liver transplantation. So like I, uh, let's start with a case, uh, you know, we're all providers, so, uh, you know, to make it more human, I think uh, cases are very useful. So let's talk about case AA. <coughs> Fellows will know this case. AA is a 40-year-old man who presents for his annual physical. He feels uh, well generally, but reports some headache and some insomnia recently. He has no past medical history and does not take any medications. He's been working long hours as a successful attorney um, and he reports drinking, you know, a few glasses of red wine with dinner every once in a while. More heavily, one with clients, but is a little vague about that. You uh, probe a little further and he tells you that he does have a family history of alcoholism. So on exam, he looks healthy, uh, like sort of a, a typical Manhattanite, um, really unremarkable. His labs are largely unremarkable and, you know, we're used to as providers seeing a whole panel of labs and glossing over a few things. But if you look a little more carefully, perhaps you might notice that he has a slight AST uh, to ALT predominance. His uh, GGTP is slightly elevated as well, but everything else looks pretty good. So you pass him off as being healthy, not to worry about too much. But you being an excellent provider, you start to get a little suspicious about uh, some of his, uh, his uh, reports. So you ask him this CAGE questionnaire, which I think a lot of you are familiar with. And so uh, the CAGE questionnaire is, have you ever, one, felt the need to cut down on your drinking, two, felt annoyed by the criticism of your drinking, three, had guilty feelings about your drinking, or four, taking a morning eye opener. And so it's a screening test. It's not a diagnostic test. You notice that this uh, questionnaire doesn't talk about uh, at all sort of the amount of alcohol consumption, which is key to this uh, sort of process in terms of diagnosing alcoholism. But if you have at least two, you have a high index of suspicion to sort of follow that up with further questioning. And four is virtually diagnostic, although again, it's really meant as a screening tool. So I think we can do better, though, at detecting alcoholism. Um, there was a study in the 1990s that demonstrated that about 50% of providers had heard of the CAGE questionnaire, but that only 14% of them actually knew all four categories of it. A uh, survey of uh, over 800 primary care physicians using case histories similar to case AA demonstrated that only 6% uh, of them accurately put alcoholism in their top five differential. Number one was irritable bowel, uh, irritable bowel syndrome. So it's often mistaken for these other kinds of etiology. So I think we can do better in terms of uh, diagnosing and detecting alcoholism. So. Um, two years ago, the American Psychiatric Association uh, came out with the DSM-5 criteria uh, where they lumped together the older terminology of alcohol abuse and alcohol dependence into alcohol use disorder, um, which can be described as sort of the harmful consequences of compulsive alcohol use. And there are now 11 criteria, I didn't put them all down here. But if you have fulfill uh, more of the criteria, you have increasing in, term in terms of severity, mild, moderate, or severe. Alcohol use disorders are very common worldwide, with almost 6% of all global deaths attributable to alcohol in 2012. 
And there's a study that just came out in JAMA Psychiatry that looked at the prevalence of uh, alcohol use disorder with this new definition. And they found using um, a large epidemiologic national database that the lifetime prevalence is almost 30% in the United States, which is astounding. The one year uh, incidence is about uh, 13%. So it's something that we need to see quite frequently if we look for it. So, you know, alcoholism can be thought of as sort of a self-inflicted kind of disease, but it's a really a common and complex disease. There's a feeling that after three decades of research, uh, at least half of the predisposition to alcohol is genetic. So, uh, I, I borrowed this uh, from the NIAAA, uh, but about 60% is thought to be genetic currently, <coughs> the remainder environmental. Um, Greater than a third of alcoholics tend to have at least one alcoholic parent in the family. Uh, but it's also complex in terms of environmental factors, such as the early first use of alcohol significantly increases the risk for alcoholic use disorders. And so you can see here that by age 15, if you have your first um, use of alcohol and you have an alcoholic parent, you have a four times greater risk of developing an alcohol use disorder versus if you do not have an alcoholic parent. So it's not a very straightforward kind of uh, uh, diagnosis, I'm sorry, uh, disease, and it has a complex interaction between genetics and the environment. This is a graph uh, demonstrating the cumulative distribution of alcohol consumption in the United <coughs> States. So while the United, while you know, we're a nation of drinkers, uh, Relatively speaking, compared to the developed world, we don't actually have a very high prevalence of alcohol use. But if you do drink alcohol, you tend to drink a lot of it. So men uh, consume more than women. And um, uh, we still run into problems because 73% of alcohol is actually consumed by only 10% of the population here, as you can see. So uh, if you do um, suspect alcohol use, your cage questionnaire is positive. It's likely that it's not just one drink every once in a while, but uh, regular drinking and consistent consumption. So, um, so how are we doing in terms of the United States? This is a depiction of the total per capita consumption of gallons of alcohol in the United States from a couple of years ago. Red being higher, blue being less. And you can see here in New York, we're not doing so bad. We're kind of middle of the road here in, in New York State. But this level of uh, alcohol consumption per capita has increased over the last couple of years here in New York State. So worldwide, alcohol is actually the third most preventable risk factor for premature death in developed countries, lagging only behind tobacco, which is number one, and two, hypertension. So this, this particular um, uh, fact struck me. Alcohol attributed fraction for death from cirrhosis worldwide is 50% higher in the US and even higher in the UK and Eastern Europe. In other words, if you have cirrhosis, uh, the likelihood that you'll die from cirrhosis is going to be highest with alcohol, not with other conditions. Okay, and this, is, this is liver related death. So while alcohol may be a, a smaller fraction of uh, the etiology of liver disease, you're more likely to die from that than other liver-related causes like hepatitis C, for example. Um, so you can see in the United States, uh, um, we're in the gray, kind of middle of the, in middle of the road, and then in Europe and Eastern Europe, uh, the prevalence is higher. Very few times in medicine you get a nice linear line like this, right? Direct relationship. So uh, it's been clearly shown over, uh, in many studies, that the rates of alcoholic liver disease are directly related to the amount of consumption. So you can see here, uh, on this uh, graph, um, the standard uh, death-related causes from uh, liver disease and cirrhosis and the amount of alcohol consumed, liters per capita. And in high prevalence countries, high consumption countries, you see a nice linear line that fits uh, very well. The more you drink, the more likelihood that you're going to die of liver disease and cirrhosis. Um, so. How do we talk about, well, drink is very common. You know a lot of people who do okay. Is there a safe limit to drinking? What's moderate consumption? Um, this study uh, probably is the, the, one of the best cited studies. It's a prospective population study uh, in Denmark. Uh, 
uh, using the Copenhagen City Heart Study Questionnaire, 13,000 patients with long follow-up, and they found that the, it, while the incidence of alcoholic cirrhosis is quite low, uh, women tend to have an increased risk of cirrhosis at a given alcohol intake. And then again, consistent with the previous slide, the risk of alcoholic liver disease increases in a dose-dependent manner. So you can see here, the curve isn't uh, linear, it's somewhat uh, asymptotic in the sense that for women in the, uh, the pink arrow, you can see that um, about seven drinks per week is where the line starts to curve in terms of uh, increasing uh, the relative risk of alcoholic liver disease. Whereas for men, the slope tends to curve a little bit later where uh, it's about t uh, two drinks a day or 14 drinks per week. And so that is the study based on which the um, National Institutes of Alcohol Abuse and Addiction, uh, uh, the NIAAA, define, quote, safe drinking or moderate drinking. And so this is where it comes from, this study, uh, this, this recommendation. So for women, in terms of binge drinking uh, on a single day, less than three drinks and uh, less than seven drinks per week, and for men, a little bit higher threshold, less than four drinks and less than 14 drinks uh, per week. And so if you follow these recommendations, only about 2% of those who drink this way um, have an alcohol use disorder. So it's likely that you'll be okay. So you know all that, and you go back to your patient and you say, all right, well, why don't you clarify what you mean by, quote, drinking a few glasses of wine with dinner and more heavily with clients? And he reports that he drinks more precisely, about four glasses of wine a night, and you know, uh, times more than 10 on occasion uh, with clients. And then it brings you to, well, what's a glass? All right, is it this one? Is it this one? Is it this one? You know, I, I found this on the internet where you can get one glass of uh, wine that will fill entire 750 milliliters <laughs> of wine. Um, and uh, so, you know, when you're talking about not knowing what the unit is of the um, process that leads to injury, you're talking about a lot of vague things, all right? And so it becomes difficult to sort of ascertain um, risk, right? So what is a drink, okay? Um, this is from the NIAAA's website, so many of you may not know this, but you know, we think of sort of a standard drink as 12 fluid ounces of beer, less so with malt liquor, um, even less, five fluid ounces of table wine, and then 1.5 ounces of uh, spirits, okay? Now, we all know that if you go to a bar, you have sort of a cheap shot or a generous shot. You know, these things, you know, it could be equated as a single drink, but is probably not. And then you gotta know the lingo a little bit too. When you talk to uh, patients with alcohol use problems, they say, well, I don't know how many drinks that is, but you know, I drink a four, 240s, you know, a, a day, uh, I drink, and you know, how many drinks is that? It's 4.5 drinks. Uh, a nice uh, way to remember this in terms of bottled wine is that it equates to about five drinks. So oftentimes you hear uh, a patient saying, well, I split a bottle of wine a night with my spouse or my partner. So that puts you at the 2.5 uh, drink limit. If you're a woman, that's over the limit for the safe drinking, okay? Uh, a pint, a fifth, a handle, do you know what these things are? In terms of alcohol use, I bet you your patients don't either. So a pint, 11 drinks. A fifth, which doesn't sound too bad, right? A fifth, <laughs> 17 drinks. A handle, maybe from college, remember this? 39 <laughs> drinks, okay? And people have no idea how many drinks there are per sort of, uh, you know, um, package essentially. So if they don't know, it's going to be hard for you to ascertain that unless you really push them to get an answer. All right. So let's talk about the natural history of alcoholic liver disease. Uh, histologically and correlating a little bit clinically. So you have a normal liver here, nice beautiful liver with portal tracts. Um, with only two weeks of heavy alcohol use, this is about what, five or six drinks a day, you develop simple steatosis without inflammation. Okay, just two weeks, that's been shown in uh, sort of volunteer studies. Uh, let's say you, you, you know that, I don't know how you volunteer for that, but it's been done. Um, after four to six weeks of abstinence, it reverses back to a normal histology. So there's a nice, you know, sort of plasticity to the liver that we know about. But let's say you continue this ongoing drinking um, and you change from this simple steatosis uh, and about 10 to 35 percent, depending on the degree of severity, uh, to a situation where you have uh, hepatitis or inflammation of the liver. 
Um, web, and this is a dynamic process. You can go from alcohol and hepatitis back to stable steatosis. And remarkably, even with many years and decades of heavy drinking, only about 15% of patients who uh, have normal livers eventually develop alcoholic cirrhosis. So there's definitely not a linear relationship there. It's, very, it's much more complicated than that. Those who have alcoholic hepatitis, it's said that up to 50% of those patients will eventually develop alcoholic cirrhosis. However, in the severe form where you're presenting with jaundice and all the sequelae of portal hypertension, in our experience, at least 80% of these patients already have early cirrhosis on biopsy. And if you have alcoholic hepatitis, a longer longitudinal study that followed patients out 18 months demonstrated that if you re-biopsy these patients, some of them uh, go back to normal, most have persistent evidence of alcoholic hepatitis, and some have already uh, uh, progressed to cirrhosis. Okay? The wide range, uh, you'll see um, why that we, uh, we're not able to be very precise about that. Okay? So uh, I'm not going to you know, belabor this point, but you, uh, you under all probably understand that alcoholic injury uh, leads to a hepatitis, classic two to one ratio that you learn in medical school. Uh, things that you may not know that uh, hepatologists tend to use is that alcohol induces the enzyme GGT different than alcophos. Okay, so you can often see a discordance in terms of GGT versus alcophos. Uh, it's a toxin to the bone marrow leading to um, uh, increased mean corpuscular volume. Uh, alcohol leads to increased absorption of iron in the duodenum and the gut leading to increased iron disease. These patients not, do not all have hemochromatosis. And the liver biopsy cannot adequately uh, distinguish between ASH versus NASH. Now, our pathologists are very good in giving us a sense and correlating with history, but ultimately that's sort of your call as a provider. And then treatment, this should be, you know, its own slide and things like that. But honestly, it's amazing how much disease you can cure with abstinence, all right? Simple abstinence and, you know, really pushing patients to remain abstinent can really dramatically change the course of a patient. And another uh, remarkable thing is that Patients, regardless of the kind of um, intervention that you have, where it's AA, motivational enhancement, cognitive behavioral therapy, STEPS program, they all lead to about the same effect in terms of being able to achieve durable uh, abstinence afterwards. So any of them, choose them, support them for your patients. And then a nutritional assessment we'll, we'll talk about later, which is important. Okay. So we have our patient AA. He comes back a year later because you said that he looked okay. Uh, for an urgent visit. He now has uh, a new sort of symptoms of yellowness, extreme fatigue, easy bruising, a big belly. Uh, he reports now that he'd been increasing his drinking to a fifth of vodka every few days. <laughs> now you know what that is. On exam, he's got a fever um, and many of the sequelae of the sort of al the alcoholic hepatitis phenotype, jaundice, bitemporal wasting, spider angiomata, hepatomegaly, a tense abdomen, with ascites, tenderness, and asterixis on his labs. Um, you can see that he has this classic leukocytosis with the neutrophilia, elevated MCV, looks like hyper, hypervolemic hyponatremia, um, markedly elevated GGTP because of recent drinking, uh, and some coagulopathy. And in, if you're not familiar with this, uh, AST, ALT ratio greater than two, total bilirubin and direct bilirubin 22-19 and sort of all markers of hepatic synthetic dysfunction. So this is something that we see all the time, okay? So now he has alcoholic hepatitis, right? This acute inflammatory syndrome of jaundice and liver injury that uh, occurs after decades of heavy use, usually at least 10 drinks a day. Uh, the age group is about 40 to 50. They're often so sick they've been absent for a couple of weeks. So that's actually uh, not that they're not telling the truth. They just they feel that lousy that they stop drinking. Uh, they have a lot of the uh, signs of uh, uh, cirrhosis on exam, uh, laboratory abnormalities. Um, we just discussed them. Uh, but the ASC ALT ratio is usually less than 500. There is a, a rare form of an indirect hyperbilirubinemia called Z syndrome, leading to uh, related to hemolysis from alcohol that you can also see. Many of them already have cirrhosis when you see them like this. The mortality rate though can vary from 15 to 80 percent, which is very wide at six months, which we'll, just, we'll, we'll discuss now. But if you think about that, 40-year-old guy, mortality rate 80 percent at six months, that's we're talking about you know, advanced neoplasm kind of rates. So how do you assess for whether this patient's going to survive, how they're going to do? So there are a variety of different uh, well-studied and published 
uh, prediction models of severity in alcoholic hepatitis. You see some listed here. I'm not going to go through all of them, but the, probably the ones that you are most familiar with would be the uh, MADRI's discriminant function. Uh, all this, many of you know the MEL, of course. And then the LEAL score, which is a newer one. You can see that they, they, a lot of them uh, share the same characteristics that are very familiar to us in terms of liver synthetic function, bilirubin, INR, creatinine, uh, in univariate analyses, things like age and albumin and uh, white count have also been important in terms of um, uh, predicting outcomes. Uh, the MADRI score is sort of the tried and true one uh, derived from a clinical trial in 1978. It uses bilirubin and an INR. Uh, the MEL can be useful as well. Uh, spent, I'm going to spend a little time with the LEAL score in that it captures the a lot of what the MEL score captures, bilirubin, INR, creatinine, uh, it captures age. Pa patients who are younger, they tend to do better, and they're likely they're not cirrhotic quite yet. And there's a dynamic component to the, the allele score, which is that there's a, you measure the change in bilirubin from day zero to day seven. So if there is an improvement in the bilirubin, it's likely that they're going to survive. And this is from the original allele paper. You have a graph here showing uh, a Kaplan-Meier curve. Uh, survival probability versus time in days after 200 days. And if you have a low LEAL score with a decline in bilirubin, good other sort of markers that suggest that you have an 85% chance of survival at six months versus a 30% so chance of survival if your LEAL score uh, is greater than 0.45. And remember, the change in bilirubin is in relation to the initiation of steroids. So this is our patient, a reminder of his labs, and we uh, apply the prediction models to his score and presentation. He's got a high uh, discriminant function, greater than 32, which is the cutoff, high meld, uh, uh, Glasgow hepatitis, ABIC scores, which I didn't go over, but these are also very high. And we don't have a little score yet because we haven't given him any therapy yet. So let's talk about therapies, all right? So, um, Tried and true, prednisolone, it's been around for more than uh, almost four decades. Uh, it's sort of a shotgun approach and inhibits transcription factors and inflammation. Madri was a uh, resident at Johns Hopkins when he started this trial, a uh, seminal trial where he derived the discriminant function and looked at prednisolone and its effects on mortality. Um, we spent almost four decades doing subsequent studies and meta-analyses that demonstrated that in this forest plot, perhaps uh, prednis Prednisolone may not be very effective, uh, so there's a lot of argument about that. Uh, we had the pleasure of seeing uh, Philippe Mataran give a, a talk here last year uh, regarding some of his work in alcoholic hepatitis, and uh, he did sort of a gold standard pooled meta-analyses where he took actually the data points of all these <laughs> clinical trials, put them all together rather than the medians, and found that there was a relative risk reduction of 30% with uh, prednisolone with a number needed to treat of five, however, which is still pretty high. And with all this combined, the ASLD recommends that uh, with these very sick patients, uh, prednisolone should be considered at the highest level of recommendation. And this is sort of his meta-analysis here in terms of demonstrating survival. Uh, note that in um, uh, the, the placebo group, uh, the mortality, the survival rate was only 65% at 28 days. So very, very lousy, okay. Um, uh, pentoxifiline, uh, which you may know as Trental, a non-selective phosphodiesterase inhibitor, um, also um, has been used in alcoholic hepatitis, inhibitor of TNF-alpha. Uh, but in the trials, it re improved survival by reducing the incidence of hepatal renal syndrome, and it did not affect TNF-alpha levels. So it suggested that while it was a, it worked, it wasn't a very rational therapy in terms of its putative mechanism of action. And so it has a less of a recommendation, although I'll show you that that has changed as well. This is the original Kaplan-Meier curve, as you can see, demonstrating improved survival with the Trental group. This is the one study that showed improved survival, but the rest of the studies, though high bias, uh, demonstrated that the forest plot crossed the one threshold, so there's some doubt as to whether that really worked. So you got prednisolone and you have pentoxifiline. What about some sort of combination of both, right? So uh, Alexander Louvé, um, who works with Philippe, uh, study, well, if we have a LEO score, you give prednisolone, they fail prednisolone after a week uh, with a, with a high, um, high uh, LEO score, maybe you could rescue them with, with pentoxifiline. So he did a study where he matched these patients, non-responders who got pentoxifiline, 
there was no survival difference at two months. What about uh, combination therapy? Would that be better? Prednisolone plus pentoxifiline versus prednisolone monotherapy alone. Um, uh, this is a JAMA article uh, two years ago that did not demonstrate any survival difference at six months. And then another combination therapy, how about prednisolone and you add um, IV and acetylcysteine or mucomist, uh, which is uh, something that us hepatologists are very comfortable using in patients with uh, acetaminophen overdose. Uh, in the um, New England Journal trial, it demonstrated that this combination therapy, prednisone plus NAC, uh, demonstrated a survival benefit at one month, but not six months. The primary endpoint was six months, so it was touted as a negative trial. However, I'll show you that this one month is actually probably the best endpoint. Right? Um, so I think of this as a positive trial, something that we should really look at. Okay. So uh, a major uh, landmark trial was just published a couple of months ago called the STAPA trial, the steroids or pentoxifiline for alcoholic hepatitis trial. It was a multi-center, huge trial had this very interesting two by two factorial double blind random, randomized uh, approach um, where it was able to uh, uh, evaluate two different agents versus placebo and in combination over 5,000 patients with alcoholic hepatitis or alcoholic liver disease were screened and then over 1,000 were randomized over three years at 65 hospitals in the UK. So a huge undertaking. You can see the study design here, placebo, placebo about 200 prednisone placebo, um, about 200, placebo plus pentoxifiline, and then combination therapy. So the idea was that we really want to see whether or not head-to-head -head prednisolone and pentoxifiline, whether it makes a difference. So these are the outcomes. At 28 days, in terms of looking at all-cause mortality, it, there was a trend to see that prednisolone uh, seemed to reduce 28-day uh, uh, mortality versus placebo or pentoxifiline, including uh, regimens. And at the end of the day, um, the odds ratio for mortality uh, was decreased in those who received a prednisolone-containing regimen, either with pentoxifiline or placebo. Um, although the p-value was very close, uh, didn't quite match uh, significance, and then pentoxifiline uh, it demonstrated that that was basically not useful or equivalent to placebo. Now, some of the limitations to this study is that the, um, uh, the placebo survival rate was higher than expected. Uh, these patients are typically sicker, um, and that um, uh, really we're not talking about uh, the impact of prednisolone on survival long term, but only short term at one month. Remember I mentioned that the combination therapy of prednisolone and IV NAC really should have been uh, used for, uh, as the endpoint for one month. These are the Kaplan-Meier curves uh, from the study, which uh, uh, really helped us answer this you know, almost four decades long question about whether prednisolone is useful. And you can see pentoxifiline versus not, the lines are exactly the same. Uh, the prednisolone graph shows uh, that those with prednisolone containing agents tend to diverge by 28 days, but one year survival, it doesn't really make a difference. Okay? So um, four decades of uh, intense research boil down to not very much. Okay? We haven't gotten very far with this orphan disease. So. Um, La last bit of uh, therapy uh, for alcoholic hepatitis, something that's pretty unique to this condition, is nutrition. Uh, there's a famous VA study um, looking at 300 veterans, many of them with mild alcoholic hepatitis. 100% of them had protein calorie malnutrition on anthropometric testing. Okay? Very few things in medicine are 100%. A Spanish study uh, randomized these patients to um, prednisolone for 28 days versus a guaranteed, sometimes NG tube driven, hospitalized patients uh, for 2,000 2, kilocalories per day. There was no difference in mortality, suggesting non inferiority. So, if we spent four decades uh, saying that prednisolone is only useful to reduce one month survival and that is the equivalent to uh, just two feeds, um, you know. It suggests that two feeds in these patients being aggressive with them, despite the presence of varices, things like that, are very important. And the ASLD also recommends uh, this kind of intervention for, um, for alcoholic hepatitis. All right. So uh, let's go back to our case. You know uh, that your patient uh, likely uh, needs uh, 
prednisolone. Uh, we treat him with prednisolone. You know the data, so you give him some combination therapy as well. You keep him in the hospital, rule out infection. Uh, his allele score, unfortunately, though, at seven days is high. There's new evidence of SIRS with acute kidney injury. Now he's on dialysis. Many of this, the, the house staff here are very familiar with this kind of patient. Um, and now his MELD is 50. So what are the options? So this is a schematic depicting um, potential therapeutic uh, targets for um, alcoholic hepatitis. And you can see here, starting at one, alcohol leads to a leaky gut, increasing gut permeability. Uh, there are various antibiotic type agents that could help neutralize that. Zinc uh, helps improve um, mucosal um, permeability. There's intra, uh, immunoglobulin to lipoprotein saccharide, li uh, lipopolysaccharide um, uh, that's playing a, a role in inflammation. Uh, if if uh, that doesn't work, uh, these, um, this bacterial translocation, bacterial process, uh, uh, leads to a stimulation of toll-like uh, receptor 4 in Kupfer cells in the liver, uh, which then are important uh, mediators of the inflammatory cascade, uh, leading to production of IL-1, uh, which is another potential target with anakinra. Um, TNF-alpha we've discussed as an important, um, uh, playing an important role in cell-mediated death uh, and inflammation and other agents such as emrecasin uh, can inhibit that. Uh, Obeta-cholic acid is an agent that uh, is being now studied in PBC and non-alcoholic steatohepatitis hepatitis has various effects which you'll be hearing more about. There is something called uh, the extracorporeal liver assist device which is a little different. Uh, it's almost like a dialysis, liver dialysis or artificial liver, um, which, uh, you know, uh, venous blood like dialysis is put into a cartridge where you have uh, immortalized um, uh, uh, hepatocytes that will help sort of do its thing. Um, phase two trials have been underwhelming in that. And probably a more theoretically interesting uh, therapy that you'll probably hear more about is using granulocyte colony stimulating factor, also known as fil filgrostim or nupogen, that has been shown in proof of concept studies to mobilize um, uh, bone marrow derived stem cells, peripheral blood mononuclear cells, uh, and there's indirect evidence that that will support and enhance uh, the function of neutrophils and hepatic regeneration. So it's a different target in terms of therapies compared to reduction of inflammation. So I think we'll hear more about that soon. Okay, so for our patient, well, transplant, right? That guy's gonna die without a transplant. Uh, you can see in, in pink here, trans, uh, alcoholic liver disease has stayed very steady over the last decade or so. Uh, hepatitis C, which is this uh, blue line up here, hopefully will start to decline with the, the advent of the new antiviral agents. Um, Putting out there the other or unknown, this is probably a lot of this is uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. All right. So this is our patient, he's in big trouble, multi-organ failure, MELD is 50, this is probably underestimates his mortality at three months, he has, probably has weeks to live, are we gonna call the palliative care team? What are the options for this patient? Okay. And so this is where I think uh, uh, providers have looked at, can we rescue these patients if they have otherwise uh, fit a low risk profile for things like relapse, disease recurrence after transplant. So this is early liver transplantation for these patients, severe alcoholic hepatitis. Philippe Maturan published this landmark paper uh, four years ago to determine whether this approach improves six month survival rate in patients where they are unresponsive to medical management according to the LEAL model. Evaluate whether these patients have a higher rate of alcohol relapse because they do not have uh, this ability to stay alive long enough to follow the six month rule of abstinence. And then to see, will this lead to sort of an over transplantation of patients of just of alcoholics essentially, um, in terms of a limited resource of, uh, of livers. So prospective multi-center study, seven transplant centers in France and Belgium over four years. Inclusion criteria are very important. Again, non-response, which we know based on the allele score, they all got biopsies. Uh, these patients had severe alcoholic hepatitis as their first liver decompensating event, which is a fancy way for saying that they really didn't know in uh, these patients of the link between their alcohol use and a severe medical problem. Okay? Um, and then there was a complete consensus of medical team circles that need to be achieved. 
uh, they could not have uh, sort of uncontrolled psychiatric disorders or other sort of um, medical issues that prevented from, uh, from transplant. They did a case control matching studies to compare outcomes. So we're not, they didn't transplant all alcoholics, okay? One out of 10 patients only were eligible to be candidates uh, for transplant. They ended up transplanting 26 of these patients uh, several deaths occurred early related to invasive aspergillosis, uh, but many of them did very well and there was a very low burden in terms of all the transplants that were done in the participating centers during the three years, four year study period. And you can see here in the Kaplan-Meier curve, uh, the outcome at two years is uh, you know, 71%, which is excellent. Um, and against natural controls, we have a dismal outcome, which we know from the previous studies. I put this arrow here to remind me to tell you that if you're going to do this, you need to do it early. These patients die uh, within two months. All right, so you're not gonna, they're not gonna survive to six months. And so that's why it's called early liver transplantation and why an expedited and intense evaluation needs to be performed. So what about relapse, right? We took a chance on these patients. In their study, three recipients, or about 12% of patients relapsed, okay? And relapse has a various definition, but patient number one, at two years, he went back, he or she went back to drinking three drinks a day. Patient number two, at two years post-transplant, uh, he or she went back to more than five drinks a day, okay? That would be considered harmful drinking for sure. And then uh, the third patient, one drink a week. This is France, after all, okay? So, uh, and none of these patients have any kind of graft dysfunction. Their grafts are working just fine. So this study showed that early liver transplantation for severe alcoholic hepatitis improved six-month survival in highly selected non-responder candidates, low burdens, low rate, low rate of relapse, and for the first time, it really challenged the notion of a sort of prescribed abstinence period and that you couldn't do medically uh, transplantation for these very sick alcoholic hepatitis patients. Can it be reproduced though? And uh, up until recently, there hasn't been uh, any papers looking at this uh, because it's a big deal, all right? So I'm here to present uh, sort of our experience here at Mount Sinai with this kind of strategy. And uh, only a few months after the paper was published, we started uh, um, a strategy very similar uh, to the, the French-Belgian protocol with a written guideline change, okay? Um, these are the methods, very similar. You have alcohol hepatitis. If you respond to medical therapy, then you're okay. Uh, if you do not have a response to medical therapy, then you need to have a first step expedited psychosocial evaluation because remember 90% of these candidates are to have poor profiles and already uh, declined for transplant. Then uh, medi uh, expedited medical evaluation, usually in house. Um, and if consensus is not achieved, then the patient is declined for early transplant, but still could be a candidate for a, sort of a traditional six-month rule try for transplant. However, if consensus is achieved, then the patient would then be accepted and listed for early liver transplantation. Remember, these patients are so sick that their MEL scores are so high, they would achieve very high priority on the waiting list. Okay? So, um, We've, we looked at about 111 consecutive patients hospitalized for alcohol hepatitis. Uh, very few of them were responders to medical therapy, but they did pretty well at six months. The vast majority, though, were non-responders or not eligible for uh, specific therapies with very high MELD scores. More than half of these patients walked in the door or were outside hospital transfers. These OSS, OSH patients, as the house staff know, uh, not eligible at all for any therapy. So we talked. In the, in the middle of the talk about these therapies, half of them are not even eligible for those, okay? So, and they're not even that great anyway. So we have nothing really for them. 20% um, of them had favorable psychosocial profiles based on our addiction team profiling. Um, because the attrition rate was so high from infection, only 16% of them survived to actually listing them officially with very high MELD scores. And then eventually uh, nine patients underwent liver, early liver transplantation here. And using a similar uh, approach in terms of match controls, we demonstrated that uh, at, at one year, we had eight out of nine patients uh, surviving uh, at one year versus controls. You can see a very rapid decline in terms of mortality uh, of patients who did not get a liver transplant. So we were also interested to take a next step further as to say, what are the characteristics of patients where we felt as a team these patients would be good candidates for transplant? And so while we made the decision, we sort of uh, teased it out a little further to say, 
what are the things that we should emphasize and that other centers can emphasize in their evaluations of, uh, of patients? Because you know, the psychosocial evaluation is not necessarily as quantitative as a stress test, for example. Okay? So we looked at the profiles of the 20 accepted candidates with good profiles and then the decline candidates with poor profiles. And we found eight significant variables, as you can see here, things like stable employment, insight, a recent life stressor. We had a couple of Sandy, Hurricane Sandy victims who uh, that was sort of the last straw in terms of increased drinking, uh, whether they were forthright <laughs> with uh, collaterals on alcohol use. And uh, in the end, having good insight and having this uh, first de liver decompensating event as an empiric uh, criteria, uh, found to, we found that to be very useful uh, in terms of our selection process. So, sorry, over three years, kind of skip, doesn't like that slide. Um, we did almost 300 uh, transplants. Only 3% of them were for early liver transplantation. Um, and the house staff should be happy to know that of the inter-hospital transfers, um, uh, 18, 18 out of the 20 provisionally accepted candidates came from the inter-hospital transfers. So we appreciate your hard work. Uh, and including three patients from other liver transplant centers uh, who are not doing early liver transplantation, suggesting that we are really a quaternary liver transplant center. Okay? So they're alive, they're doing well. Two years out, eight out of nine, no rejection, graft dysfunction. They all enrolled in rehab programs. Uh, in terms of alcohol relapse, we had basically two kind of relapse events. One where there are uh, slips by out the recipient three, which is drinking with a return to abstinence. Uh, and then one patient who clearly relapsed uh, who was a 31-year-old woman. Uh, you could look back sort of in hindsight, well, she didn't really meet the first decompensating event criteria. She didn't have great insight into her alcoholism. There wasn't really something that could be reversed in terms of explaining why she increased her drinking. So in retrospect, perhaps that was someone that we um, uh, you know, may have thought differently of. However, she is back to work and, you know, uh, uh, providing some benefit to society, so there's some question marks about that. So our conclusion, we can do it. All right, I'm gonna skip this a little bit. We can do it, but the question is, you know, should we do it, right? Uh, medically, surgically, it's feasible. Should we do it? So let's talk a little bit at the end here about the six month rule, because that's something that I think people are thinking of while they're hearing about early transplant. So the origins are from the eight, 1983, where they excluded alcoholic hepatitis. Um, a conference about a decade later uh, suggested that there's a strong consensus that requires most alcoholic patients to be absent from alcohol for at least six months before they can be listed. Uh, we work on consensus, so the vast majority of centers require this six-month rule absence. Okay. However, it's not really a rule because further down the paragraph you see exceptional patients with alcoholic liver disease who have not been absent for six months who we feel that are, could be otherwise good candidates can be referred for consideration. So it's really not a rule and it's really not based on a lot of data. So let's go through some of the arguments at the uh, last few minutes here um, in favor of the six month rule and I'll do sort of a point counterpoint uh, to these things. So number one, it may allow time for the liver to stabilize and obviate the need for liver transplant, all right? So we know that already many of them are non-responders and eligible for therapies. Uh, yes, if they get better, then they don't need a transplant. That's always better than giving them a transplant. But now we have a legal score that we know can identify these patients who have very poor outcomes, very high mortality. They all die within the first two months. They're not going to survive. You've got to make decisions uh, quickly. Um, number two, the six-month rule examines the patient's commitment to sobriety while implementing preventive strategies against future relapse. Okay? So, you know, you may think that the six-month rule as a hepatologist and a transplanter, um, uh, you know, you've selected them out very nicely, they're on the wait list, they're doing well, but there's a study that demonstrated anonymously that a quarter of your patients with alcoholic liver disease and cirrhosis admitting are, uh, are drinking, all right, at least one drink while on the waiting list, okay? Uh, the rate of relapse after liver transplantation for alcoholic cirrhosis is 20% at three to five years, despite meeting the six-month rule, okay? Uh, and these patients are doing just fine clinically, okay? Um, and then the data supporting the utility of the six-month rule in reducing the rate of relapse is actually very conflicting and that uh, there are many studies show that uh, you may be penalizing those patients and, you know, they're dying unnecessarily 
Um, a lot of the studies that show that the longer absence before transplant, the less likelihood of relapse. These are patients who have been absent for five, 10 years, okay, which is probably not appropriate either. Number three, this strategy has enabled similar, if not better, five-year survival than other indications, uh, but unlikely with uh, active hepatitis. Well, there have been three studies that have looked at sort of what I describe as the oops kind of study, where you transplant them and actually there's active disease and recent alcohol injury in these uh, uh, single center chart reviews or UNOS database searches, there was no difference between those who had uh, alcoholic hepatitis on the removed explanted liver compared to match controls. They did exactly the same, suggesting that even if they had some alcohol injury recently before transplant, they did just as well as those who were absent for many years. And lastly, the thing that's sort of more kind of a gut feeling kind of thing is um, these patients have a self-inflicted condition for which they are personally responsible uh, and they, you're wasting a liver on these patients and the public opinion will therefore uh, reduce organ donation, right? So, but this notion of personal responsibility for alcoholism also applies to other indications for liver transplantation. <coughs> what about the patient with acute hep B or hep C from distant intravenous drug use or unprotected sex with a sex worker? Uh, ecstasies induced acute liver failure from a rave. Do these are these patients uh, equally um, less deserving or more deserving? What about the patient who knows that they have problems with metabolic syndrome and makes daily decisions that uh, affect their health and still they are not able to make changes uh, related to uh, obesity and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? So you could also apply those conditions which are no-brainers in terms of transplanting these patients to the alcoholic hepatitis group. And if you use the acetaminophen overdose patients as sort of a surrogate for these patients in that they often have psychosocial issues um, and we're giving them the benefit of the doubt, it's a very clear, well-accepted indication for transplant. Very few of these patients after this intervention go back to disease recurrence and self-harm. 2% from self-harm, three attempt suicide from the UK experience. So these patients do well. Something may change these patients after trying to save their life with transplant. So in terms of the public opinion issue, um, I think you could have a strong argument that this is not a self-inflicted uh, condition in terms of the genetic component. Surveys of public opinion um, show that you know, there, people are less apt to select alcoholics uh, than other indications for transplant. However, in uh, these studies, they, these opinions also vary significantly with healthcare providers, usually not supporting those in the fringes of society. You know, as providers, you know, these are things that we uh, are trying to uh, non-judgmentally try to treat patients in the best way possible. And then there's a famous case of George Best, who some of you may know, very famous uh, footballer, um, uh, Manchester United, uh, who had alcoholic liver disease. He had a very colorful life. Um, 16 months after his liver transplant for alcoholic cirrhosis, he went back to drinking, seen at the pub, things like that. And there was a public outcry as to whether or not he should have got a transplant. Um, and there's early indications after that um, publicity that uh, organ donation declined. But after one year, it demonstrated subsequently that there was no change in the rates of donation. Because think about it, families who are in a situation where their loved one is going to donate uh, their organs to save other people, they're not thinking about this. They're thinking about how can we turn this negative situation into something that can be life saving for many others. So when we talk about this in terms of our goals, indications for transplant, we need to ask ourselves, what is our goal of transplant? Is it preventing disease recurrence? Hepatitis C 100% of the time causes uh, disease recurrence. Is it overall survival? Is it benefit to society? These early alcoholic hepatitis patients, in our experience, half of them have gone back to work. It's a complex uh, mix of uh, decision making. So uh, I want to conclude by demonstrating this sort of uh, treatment algorithm, alcoholic hepatitis. You diagnose it um, by your precise history. You calculate uh, their prediction models. If they have mild alcoholic hepatitis, then they're probably OK. You should follow them uh, better in nutrition. They have severe alcoholic hepatitis. Look for things that precludes them from receiving prednisolone, essentially, nutrition, intravenous uh, NAC for five days. The days of pentoxifiline are over. Um, calculate their little score in terms of response after one week and then continue it or possibly 
uh, consider them for early liver transplantation. So in conclusion, alcohol use disorders are common. They're harmful. Consider them. Think about them. Uh, we still don't know the factors influencing the natural history of alcoholic liver disease. Prediction models can be very useful. Um, we're boiled down to uh, prednisolone and possibly MAC reducing one month mortality. That's it. Nothing long term. Intoxifilines over early liver transplantation for these patients is an option in only a very few highly selected patients. And um, the key point is that alcoholic hepatitis carries a poor prognosis with almost no treatment. So really it goes early in terms of prevention, which is the key. <coughs> Thank you for your time. You, you started to talk about the Copenhagen study, and in that study, actually, as I recall, there was a decreased incidence of all-cause dementia, including vascular dementia and Alzheimer's disease. And so my thinking is that one or two drinks a day may be okay for the liver, may be good for the brain, and I think everybody would agree it's good for the heart. So is there any way to tease these people apart who are going to go on? Is there any risk prediction model that weighs the benefits of trying to prevent dementia, prevent coronary disease, and yet maybe damage your liver a little bit? Or right. Not? To, to, so to summarize your question a little bit, um, so there has been studies uh, looking at sort of moderate alcohol consumption and its impact on other uh, uh, sort of metabolic syndrome type of uh, disorders such as cardiovascular risk, stroke risk, and things like that. Uh, it's interesting that you mentioned that there was a, a paper that was just published in Lancet uh, that looked at um, uh, the impact of moderate consumption of alcohol, looking at you know, similar numbers, 30,000 patients, something like that, to the Copenhagen study, that demonstrated that there was indeed a, um, um, a benefit of, uh, in terms of reducing cardiovascular mortality uh, with the use of, um, uh, with moderate consumption of alcohol, uh, but that, uh, you know, sort of the byproduct of that is also increasing the odds ratio of alcohol-related problems, such as you know, liver disease, clearly, but also things like uh, oropharyngeal cancers, all different kinds of cancers as well. So uh, I think that uh, the uh, you know it kind of boils down to uh, we have these sort of blunt instruments to try to assess this. We have an, a sense that there's some uh, ways that. Uh, alcohol can be useful in some and uh, not useful in others, and I think this is where the sort of genetic, being a little more precise about precision medicine role can can uh, can play. But what is the science that uh, leads us to use the age of 55 or so, whatever that age is, as the limit for both the recipient of the transplant and the donor? So uh, 55 is, is, if I understand your question correctly, is typically sort of the age uh, cutoff for uh, a living-related donation uh, to be acceptable. Um, you know, in terms of being a recipient, you know, we ha we trans we've transplanted a 78-year-old and things like that. You know, physiologic age is more important to us than the, the actual number, per se. Um, you know, when you get to 55, uh, and studies have demonstrated this, the older the donors are, uh, particularly for an adult-to-adult -adult type of donation, uh, using the, uh, the, the right lobe, uh, patients, uh, they don't tolerate it well in terms of the donors. And so we really want to minimize the risk to the donor uh, to be able to make sure that they survive the surgery and otherwise being a healthy person. One more question. So just for the house staff, I know a lot of times we'll present MELD scores daily. Um, and I know that there's some papers about the Delta MELD scores. Can we talk about that? Sure. That's a great question. So, uh, you know, the MELD score is, uh, is something that we love as a hepatologist. Uh, we're probably one of the most validated uh, scoring systems uh, in medicine. Uh, it has been used, uh, unlike some of these other prediction models, to be used serially, you know, every day, like you say, to be able to adequately assess risk in a dynamic way. So uh, specific to alcoholic hepatitis, um, a, a sort of another cheap LEAL score that we often use without pulling out our calculator or our smartphone is what is the MELD doing? Is the MELD going up? Is it going down? The delta MELD, the change in MELD um, is often the first clue to either a new insult that's happening with the patient 
or a, a change in the situation that demonstrates that this patient indeed is not going to get better, especially when they're sort of on the threshold of, uh, of um, clinical stability and biologic, you know, biochemical stability to suggest that these patients need more attention and perhaps we should proceed with transplant. Let's thank Dr. Impurstow.